Jesus is alive and death could not hold him. But the important thing this morning, I want us to take a look at Jesus as the Lamb of God. I don't know where you are with God. I don't know what's in your mind when you think about this whole thing we're doing. I spent some time this week with a couple of friends of mine, one of them a new friend, and uh, as we got talking over dinner the other night about uh, religion, he was talking religion, I was talking about Jesus, and uh, he proceeded to tell me this whole thing is a phony deal. I mean, man, you know, you're a nice guy, but you're working on a phony deal. And, and then he finally said, uh, I'll tell you what, when I get down to my last hour, I'll give you $100 and you come and shape things up so I can get there. You know, that just ticks me off. I want, I want to just deck a guy who thinks that for 100 bucks, I mean, number one, if I'm going to put a price on this thing, baby, it's going to be a lot of money. A lousy 100 bucks, you can lose that in a moment of time. You know what I mean? But to think he could get fixed up, that I could fix him up. You see, belief system is your individual responsibility and to deal with the matter that is here in the scripture concerning who Jesus is, that's the key issue. A lot of folks talking about God. In fact, it's very popular today, according to the latest reports, it's easy to talk about God, but it is not easy to talk about Jesus. And you wanna close down a conversation in a hurry? Get with a bunch of guys and get to talking about Jesus. And the guy that just used his name in vain will tell you, shut up, I don't want to talk about that. It's always amazing to me. I like to do that to guys. When they're throwing Jesus' name around, I like to say, let's talk about him. He's a friend of mine. I want to just share a little bit. Let me tell you what the Lord did. Oh, shut up. <laughs> you ought to try that. It's a great tactic. It's fun. When we go over to John chapter 1, this is the day after the baptism of Jesus when John the baptizer discovered who Jesus was. Now get this straight. He absolutely swears two times in this passage in John 1. He said, I did not know who he was. He said, I knew there was one coming. I was preparing the way for someone and I said, soon a man is coming who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before I did. Truth is, John is six months older than Jesus. But he says, he knowing who he was, this one that, that I'm preparing the way for, he existed long before I did. I didn't know he, Jesus, was the one, but I've been baptizing with water in order to point him out to Israel. And then John said, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, when you see the Holy Spirit descending and resting upon someone, he is the one you're looking for. He is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the Son of God. There is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We are so casual about this. We read the scripture so easily. We move along to the next thing on the agenda. We don't stop very long to think about all that's gone on here. But when John points out Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he is saying this to a bunch of Jews. And remember, these Jews, when they would go to the synagogue, would listen to the scriptures being read, all of the Old Testament prophecies that were being read, and this statement had to make them think when they talked about the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. I would think their thoughts would turn maybe to Abel. Remember Cain and Abel? A couple of brothers born to Adam and Eve. And after they'd all been driven out of the garden and God had set up a plan for how they could come to him and that plan involved a blood sacrifice of a perfect animal, they came to worship 
Cain was a farmer. Cain brought the best stuff he had. I don't believe for one minute that Cain brought a bunch of old scraggly, old worn out, curled up vegetables. I think he brought the best stuff he had and he laid it there before the Lord and God turned it down. And Abel came along and he laid down that offering of that lamb that he had slain just like God had instructed him to do and God receives his offering and Cain is ticked off. He is really sore and God said, what's the matter? What's the matter, Cain? If you'll just do the right thing, your offering will be accepted. And Cain got so ticked off, he did what other people do. They get angry at somebody else because they're not obeying. So what's he do? Kills his brother. Their minds had to go back to that story. Or I think their minds had to go back to Abraham. Abraham, the friend of God, that one who finally got that son that God had been promising for years, and that kid gets up and gets to be 12, 13 years old, and God says, Abraham, I want you to take your son and put him on the altar and sacrifice him. He takes a big deep breath, okay. And they get all ready to go. He's got Isaac, that's the kid. Guy's got the wood on his back. They're going up the hill and old Isaac looks up and says, hey dad, oh, we've got the wood and we've got the fire and we got everything except uh, we don't have a sacrifice. Pretty observant kid. Might have been a little lump in his throat. That lump got bigger, I'm sure, when dad put him on the altar and raised that dagger. But remember something Abraham had said to Isaac. He had said to him, God will provide a sacrifice. And sure enough, with his hand raised, and God said, enough! Don't do it. Now I know that you trust me. There's a ram caught in the thicket. And they went and got that and sacrificed that ram to the Lord. Or their mind might have gone to the Passover lamb. We hear that word Passover and a lot of us don't know what it means, but it celebrates that night in Egypt when the slaves, the Israelis had been there over 400 years. And they were set to leave and Moses kept back, coming back and saying to Pharaoh, let my people go. And he would say, I will, and then recant and say, no deal. And the, the plagues came. Boy, I love to read the stories about the plagues. The flies, huh? Flies everywhere, huh? You ever just eat, have a fly jump right in your mouth in the middle of a meal, huh? huh? Flies everywhere. Frogs everywhere. They had this series of plagues and they wouldn't turn them loose and finally at the end God said, okay, yeah, this is it. Now you Israelis take the blood of an animal, a perfect animal, and put that blood on the sides of the doorposts and over the top of the door. Not on the threshold. We will not walk on the blood of the lamb, but on either side and, and above the door and when the death angel comes, the death angel will pass over you. That's why they called it Passover. And those Egyptians, they heard this story, and that's a bunch of foolishness, big deal. They didn't put any blood on the door. And the death angel came across, and that firstborn in every home, as well as the firstborn of the cattle, where there was no blood over the door, died that night. And the scripture tells us the wail that went up in Egypt. Just imagine if from one end of this country to another, there were some kind of a plague that touched every home. You can hear the wail all across America. They could hear the wail all across Egypt. Never since has there been that kind of wailing in Egypt that they had that night when they refused to listen to the word of God. And refuse to apply the blood. Some could have thought of that one. Or some could have thought about all of the instructions in the book of Leviticus concerning the lamb and the worship in the tabernacle. It's a wonderful and complicated story, but you might take time to read it just to be reminded how wonderful it is to be on this side of the cross because all of these were pointing to Jesus Christ, the perfect 
one-time sacrifice that would come. That one talked about in Isaiah chapter 53 where it says he's oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. From prison and trial, they led him away to his death. But who among the people realized that he was dying for their sin, that he was suffering their punishment? He had done no wrong and he never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan, Jehovah's good plan to crush him and fill him with grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have a multitude of children, many heirs. That's us. Oh, they could have thought about all of that, but I'll tell you this. They would immediately think of these things and would grasp the fact that John was identifying Jesus as the fulfillment of all of that Old Testament prophecy when he said, there's the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And just a larger look at that lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ is the lamb provided by God. See, the Jews were accustomed to providing their own lambs for temple sacrifices, but this lamb of Jehovah's, this lamb that Jehovah provided not just for one individual, not just for one family, not just for a nation, but for the whole world. This is the lamb that took away the sin of the world. That's the one that Jehovah provided. He is the lamb who was the incarnated God himself. When you read John chapter one, you will find there are eight titles used in this one chapter, all of them implying his deity, that he truly was the Son of God, the Word, the life, the light, the Son, the Lamb, the Messiah, the King, the Son of Man. All of those are in chapter one of John, applying directly to Jesus. You see, the truth is that our Lord Jesus was the divine Lamb. If he could bear the sin of the world, he had to be God because no mere human creature could satisfy God's price for sin. In Psalm chapter 49, listen to these words. Yet they cannot redeem themselves or redeem the life of another from death. They cannot redeem them by paying a ransom to God. Redemption does not come so easily for no one can ever pay enough to live forever and never see the grave. There's no way that anyone other than God himself could be that one and could satisfy the anger of God against our sins. He is the Lamb of God, that substitute that satisfies God Almighty. In Isaiah chapter 42, there's this great passage. This is 800 years before Jesus came to this earth. Listen to this. Look at my servant whom I strengthen. He is my chosen one and I am pleased with him. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? He is my chosen one, I am pleased with him. Eight centuries later, at the baptism of Jesus, we read in Luke chapter three that one day when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. And as he was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove and a voice from heaven said, you are my beloved son, I am fully pleased with you. 800 years between that passage in Isaiah 42 and that fulfillment in Luke chapter three. You see, the conclusion you must reach is this, that from the first day until his dying hour, Jesus had one thing in mind, and that was our redemption. We read in Isaiah 43, verse 21, I have made Israel for myself, that some way they will honor me before the, verse two, 43, verse two, 
when you go through deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. For I, the Lord your God, your Savior, a ransom from freedom, I have given for you. When we understand this, that this Jesus, this one in sinless humanity, in union with his boundless divinity. And people, I don't understand that, okay? I think it's really important that guys get up and get the postulate. I listen to sermons all the time of other guys. I hear them saying things. I just wrote a note. I, I subscribed to a service so I can listen to other guys preach. And they had a guy on there to teach you how to preach. That's the sorriest mess I've ever heard in my life. I wrote those guys and said, I pay good money for this. I want something good in return. That guy confused everybody. Preach one sermon like that, you can empty the building permanently. But to understand this, that we can't understand, when the sinless humanity of Jesus in union with his boundless divinity, that can make an atonement well-pleasing to God that covers the sin of everyone who will receive it. And the question is, have you received it? Second Corinthians chapter five, that's your assignment for the week. And I wanna read you just a few verses here at the end of this chapter. All this newness of life is from God who brought us back to himself through what Christ did. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. This is the wonderful message he's given us to tell others. I tell you something, folks, this is not for the pros. This is not for the professionals. This is not for the preachers. This is for the children of God, those who have faith in Christ and call themselves Christian. This is the wonderful message he's given us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassadors and God is using us to speak to you. We urge you as though Christ himself were here pleading with you, be reconciled to God. There are times when people come to me and they say, man, you are really blazing away this morning. What is the deal? The deal is this. When I understand, as I do, that I stand in the place of Christ himself pleading with you to come to Christ and acknowledge him as your savior, that's a heavy, heavy load to stand in the shoes of Christ himself and declare that message, be reconciled to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. As God's partners, we beg you not to reject this marvelous message of God's great kindness. For God says, at just the right time I heard you, on the day of salvation, I helped you. And my question is, have you put your faith in Jesus yet? Are you still waiting? Are you saying, as my friend did the other day, well, when I get close to the end, I'll give you a hundred bucks and you can do something for me and get me ready. I said, pal, it may be too late. You may not have a deathbed. Your deathbed may be Highway 99. Boom, and it's over. You better get ready. And as I was discussing our three-way conversation with my other friend who was there who was a believer and saying to him, you know, it can get discouraging listening to a guy. You know, what kind of an idiot says, hey, I'll give you a hundred bucks and you can fix it up with God just before I check out. You, you, you just want to smash him. And my friend said to me, he doesn't know he needs God yet. Well, it's a great statement. Do you understand yet that you need the Lord? For I believe when that realization comes to an individual, then it's time to make the move. That's exactly what the word of God says today at just the right time, the day of salvation, the day of your opportunity to come to Christ and put your faith in him. And I ask you, 
Have you faced your need? And having faced your need, then it's time to make the move. To say, I know, I need you now. And get that move made. Stand with me. And let's pray as we go. Father, we realize that nothing is more profitable for us as believers than to continuously behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Continuously be aware. Continuously think about how grateful we are that in your mercy and in your grace you brought salvation to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Words cannot express our thanks. And Father, I think of those who are worshiping with us right now that do not yet know the Lord. Oh, they've They've recognized that there is need, but they haven't done anything about it. Oh, how I pray, how I pray that today might be the day when they'd pull a card out of that rack and fill it out, put it in one of these boxes that where we might come to them. And open the word of God with them and lead them to the Savior. Hear our prayer, dear Father. Answer, we pray, to the glory of God who sent the sinless Lamb of God to once and for all cover our sin and make us right with God Almighty. Bless us, we pray. May this be a profitable week of prayer and of caring for folks that need to be in a place where they hear the message, we trust you that you'll grant your blessing to choir and tech crew and, and Berger and all that crowd and all the people that come to pray in that prayer vigil. Lord, may this be a wonderfully productive week. We'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.